So we have here what is essentially the ones that you are most likely to use in chemistry. We have a more complete set in the table in the book. I mean, this guy even includes the really big one, Zeta, and the really small one, Zepto. These are units that you're more likely to use in a physics setting. The Zeta, that would be something you would find uh, in astrophysics. And the Zepto, that would be something you were doing in like oh, laser physics. That's where you would find these sorts of numbers. We don't tend to use the large ones in chemistry. We tend to use the small ones because we're working with small amounts and small amounts of time. And so, if you look at the list that we have here, you'll see that I only have two that are bigger than one, the mega and the kilo. The rest of them are all listed as smaller than one because that's more likely what we would be using in chemistry. So these are the ones that are most important to us in chemistry. And we have a little examples here. A megawatt might refer to the amount of energy generated by a wind turbine. A kilometer is a, is a distance we might use, but we're much more likely to use things like a milliliter. Okay, where would you encounter a milliliter in real life? Well, that's the amount of something that might be delivered in a syringe milliliters. Micrometers, that's about a cell diameter. Nanometers, that's the sort of unit you would use to start measuring the length of chemical bonds. And picometers would be talking about the diameter of an atom. So this is why this sort of range is what's important to us in chemistry, because those are the ones we'll be using most often. Naturally, since we brought up this, it means we are worried about measuring things. Now, if you're measuring something, you're using tools and they are never exact. The measurement that you get, you're going to have a potential, a possibility of accuracy that is given by the manufacturing process. And then there's the actual accuracy that you personally manage. So as you get better with the tools, you can get closer and closer to the possible accuracy. Some are very nice and just give you all the digits digitally. That eliminates uh, user error to a large extent. But there are other things that you simply have to learn how to do it yourself. So. Here is an example. You're going to use a tool. You're going to write down all the digits that you actually see, and then you add one guess and make sure that you write down your units. So here is a block. Someone has put a ruler next to it. The ruler is in centimeters. So the large numbers are in centimeters. Well, the person looks at it casually and they see that it's more than four, but less than five. That lets them write down the four. Then they get closer. They bring their face closer to this to try to figure out the ones that are still marked, but not labeled. Okay. And they say, oh, here's the midway point. That would be 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So they see it's past 0 0.8. So they put the 0 0.8. So that is writing all the digits that you see. Then you make one guess. So you look at that and you say, well, how far did it go to the next marking? This person decided two. Another person could look at it and say, well, you know, I think that's more like three or maybe even four. If somebody said it was eight, I would say they should look at it again. But that last digit is someone's best guess. It's going to be close to right. And that is why when we look at this, we would say we could do this measurement to three significant figures. Two of them we're absolutely certain of, and the last one is our best guess. So this is how significant figures start to come into play as you do an experiment. Now, we're talking about measuring things, and one of the things you'll use as a measuring device is a thermometer. The thermometer is going to give you a number in a particular scale. The ones that you use in lab will be set, you know, there's a little button on them. You can flip from one side to the other if you want Fahrenheit or Celsius. We'll always be using the Celsius side in lab, but a lot of times we'll need to convert it to Kelvin. You will have to know something about how to convert between the scales. Now, one thing I wanted to point out is that you see that 212 is boiling for water in Fahrenheit. 100 is boiling in Celsius. 
32 is freezing and zero is freezing. So if you subtract here, you will get 180. If you subtract here, you get 100. 180 divided by 100, if you reduce it down, you get 9 fifths for the fraction. This 9 and 5 are going to show up in the formulas that allow you to convert between one and the other. And really what it means is in the same distance that you have 9 degrees in Fahrenheit, you would see only 5 degree marks in Celsius. That's what it literally works out to be. So if you ever need to find the temperature, and this is in degrees Celsius, you can always work through a formula. Now remember, there's only five markings for every nine in the Fahrenheit scale, so that's where this nine-fifths comes from. And the other thing that has to be done is this it's not the same as that. The freezing point of 32 versus the freezing point of zero. And what we do is, at the first thing we do, I should say, is take the Fahrenheit temperature, subtract 32, then multiply it by 9 fifths, multiply it by 5 ninths, and you will get the temperature in degrees Celsius. The other way around, then, if you ever need to know what the degrees Fahrenheit are, works out to be this way. Now you'll notice you do this multiplication before you add the 32. That's just completely inverting the first formula to create the second formula. Now the other one that we will often use is that we need it in Kelvin because Kelvin is considered absolute temperature. It is based on the same scale as degrees Celsius. That is to say, you see, there's no fraction in front of this. It's not a nine-fifths or five-nines. It's just one-to-one. -one. The degrees are exactly the same size. They are only shifted. And most of the time, you'll just add 273 to it because most of the time you'll only have your temperature in a whole number of degrees. Now, the thing is, this is an approximation. The actual number is 273.15, but quite often we are only adding, you know, I know it's 23 degrees Celsius. Oh, I don't know that, so I end up just ignoring it. On the other hand, your thermometers in the lab will give you tenths. So if you got 23.2 and you needed to convert it to Kelvin, you would go ahead and say, 273.15, you'd go ahead and add it, and then you would round it back and say, oh wait, I can't use that digit because I only know here for significant figures. So you would end up rounding it to 296.4. This brings us to a couple of terms that are used in, in uh, doing your lab reports particularly. Uh, they're precision and accuracy. And I've grabbed this from a different scientific textbook on chemistry because you might see it when you take a different course, all right? They will say that you can have precision and accuracy. Precision, but not accurate. So, okay. So, if since I have four of these, what they're saying is everything on the top is precise. Anything on the bottom is not precise. Anything on the left is accurate. Anything on the right is not accurate. That's what they've done here. So if you look, you see precise and accurate. Oh yes, this person did very well at centering everything at hitting this target. Over here, precise but not accurate. Oh, they did a nice job of getting all their shots the same, but they didn't actually hit the center. Precise but not accurate. Neither accurate nor precise. No, nope, they're not anywhere near the center and they're all spread out. Oh my. Now here's the one that I find problematic. They're trying to say this is accurate, but not precise. Excuse me, most of the bullseyes that I've seen have a very small center circle, not this huge one that they've put here, to try to say that there's something that would be accurate, but not precise. Mm. No, this reminds me of a joke. The joke is that two um, mathematicians decide to go bow hunting, all right? They're going out with their bows. They're going to go and hit these targets, and it turns out one of them just barely misses the target on the left. The other one just barely misses the whole target. 
no, no, no holes at all on the right. And the two of them turn to each other, high five and say, hey, on average, we got it exactly right. Okay, this is just terrible. So this is just, are you willing to accept really large error bars? That's what they're really saying here. It has nothing to do with it's being accurate. So I prefer the one that is in your book, which has only three. Again, they've done targets. This time they've used a dartboard. And you can see that in this one, it is accurate and precise because all of them are very close to the center and very close to each other. Here we have, they are precise because they're all grouped very nicely, but they are not accurate because they're not here near the center. And then there's this, neither accurate nor precise, although at least they didn't put any of the darts into the wall. So they're probably still doing better than me. <laughs> Now, what can we do with this as far as something that might show up for you in uh, a lab report, for example? You might have some data sets, and you would have to try to figure out from them whether something was accurate or precise. Now, if you are just writing down a data set, I'll call this first one Q. Here's a data set that somebody got, 1.68, 1.67. 1.69, 1.69. Oh, they're all very close together. I can just look at this immediately and say that it is precise. I can say nothing yet about accuracy. We'll mention that in a little bit. Here's another data set that somebody came up with. They got 1.70, 1.63, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79. These are really not near each other. I mean, think about what we're saying. We said that when we wrote this down, we were writing it down using significant figures. And so we were sure of the first one, you're sure of the second one, and the third one was a guess. But look, this was a seven, this is a six, that's a seven, that's a five. I'm starting to wonder if I really should be able to say I have three sig figs for these. Mm, I'm not so clear. So this is not precise. Then one more grouping. This person got 1.72, 1.75, 1.76, 1.77, 1.78, 1.79. This one is also precise. They're all nicely grouped together. But these guys were all working on the same experiment. So this is precise and this is precise, but these are giving you two different sorts of answers. That brings us to how about this other thing about accuracy? Well, you can't judge accuracy until you know what the accepted value is. Now we'll be able to go back and judge the accuracy as well as the precision. So we find out the accepted value for this is 1.74. Oh my, this is not precise, so hey, it's not going to be accurate. It just isn't. That's the way we want you to view it. So it's not accurate. How about this? Well, none of them even is at 1.74. So this is not accurate. This is precise, but not accurate. And then lastly, we have this grouping. I have a couple that are above it and a couple that are below the accepted value. That's very nice. So this one is accurate. This last set is both precise and accurate. The first one was precise, but not accurate. And this middle one was neither precise nor accurate. Now we just got through doing something about precision and accuracy just from a list. But you're likely to actually graph something and look at it that way. So precision then, how close together repeated measurements are. Oh, that's very much like the dartboard, right? So these are very close together. If this was a group of measurements, you would say, oh, that's quite precise. I like that. This set was another one, the longer arrows. You'd say, well, that's not very precise. These are not close together. These two are, but the others are quite far from it. So this is not very precise. Accuracy, how close is it to the true value? So you would mark on there, what is the accepted value? And then you'd say, oh, how close did I get to that? Um, yeah, <laughs> this set, although it was quite precise, was not near the actual value. So you need to make sure that you understand how to figure out whether something is precise 
and after that, whether it is accurate from either something graphical or a list like we had previously.